wherein Mira the seeress, Zephyrine, and the fatal Amadee are successively brought upon the scene, and wherein the notion of Euripides that those whom Zeus wishes to crush he first makes mad, is illustrated by the terrible example of Monsieur Sariette. Isa pointed at his failure to enlighten an ecclesiastic renown for his clarity of mind, and frustrated in the hope of finding his angel again on the high road of orthodoxy, Maurice took it into his head to resort to occultism and resolved to go and consult a seer. He would have undoubtedly applied to Madame de Thebes, but he had already questioned her on the occasion of his early love troubles, and her replies showed such wisdom that he no longer believed her to be a soothsayer. He therefore had recourse to a fashionable medium, Madame Mira. He had heard many examples quoted of the extraordinary insight of the CRS, but it was necessary to present Madame Mira with some object which the absent one had either touched or worn and to which her translucent gaze had to be attracted. Maurice, trying to remember what the angel had touched since his ill-fated incarnation, recollected that in his celestial nudity he had sat down in an armchair on Madame d'Albel's black stockings and that he had afterwards helped that lady to dress. Maurice asked Gilbert for one of the talismans required by the clairvoyant. But Gilbert could not give him a single one, unless, as she said, she herself were to play the part of the talisman. For the angel had, in her case, displayed the greatest indiscretion, and such agility that it was impossible always to forestall his enterprise. On hearing this confession, which nevertheless told him nothing new, Maurice lost his temper with the angel, calling him by the names of the lowest animals and swearing he would give him a good kick when he got him within reach of his foot. But his fury soon turned against Madame Diables, he accused her of having provoked the insolence she now denounced, and in his wrath he referred to her by all the zoological symbols of immodesty and perversity. His love for Arcade was rekindled in his heart, and burned with a more ardent flame than ever, and the deserted youth, with outstretched arms and bended knees, invoked his angel with sobs and lamentations. During his sleepless nights it occurred to him that perhaps the books the angel had turned over before his incarnation might serve as a talisman. One morning, therefore, Maurice went up to the library and greeted Monsieur Sariette, who was cataloguing under the romantic gaze of Alexander d'Esparvieu. Monsieur Sariette smiled, but his face was deathly pale. Now that an invisible hand no longer upset the books placed under his charge, now that tranquility and order once more reigned in the library, Monsieur Sariette was happy, but his strength diminished day by day. There was little left of him but a frail and contented shadow. One dies, in full content, of sorrow past. Monsieur Sariette, said Maurice, you remember that time when your books were disarranged every night, how armfuls disappeared, how they were dragged about, turned over, ruined, and sent rolling helter-skelter as far as the gutter in the Rue Palatine. Those were great days. Point out to me, Monsieur Sariette, the books which suffered most. This proposition threw Monsieur Sariette into a melancholy stupor, and Maurice had to repeat his request three times before he could make the aged librarian understand. At length he pointed to a very ancient Talmud from Jerusalem as having been frequently touched by those unseen hands. An apocryphal gospel of the third century, consisting of twenty papyrus sheets, had also quitted its place time after time. Gassendi's correspondence too seemed to have been well thumbed. But, added Monsieur Sariette, the book to which the mysterious visitant devoted the most particular attention was undoubtedly a little copy of Lucretius adorned with the arms of Philippe de Vadome, Grand Prieur de France, with autograph annotations by Voltaire, who, as is well known, frequently visited the temple in his younger days. The fearsome reader who caused me such terrible anxiety never grew weary of this Lucretius and made it his bedside book, as it were. His taste was sound, for it's a gem of a thing. Alas! The monster made a blot of ink on page 137 which perhaps the chemists with all the science at their disposal will be powerless to erase. And Monsieur Sariette heaved a profound sigh. He repented having said all this when young D. Esparvieu asked him for the loan of the precious Lucretius. Vainly did the jealous custodian affirm that the book was being repaired at the binders and was not available. Maurice made it clear that he wasn't to be taken in like that. 
He strode resolutely into the abode of the philosophers and the globes and seating himself in an armchair said, I am waiting. Monsieur Seriat suggested his having another edition. There were some that, textually, were more correct and were, therefore, preferable from the student's point of view. He offered him Barbu's edition, or Cusselier's, or, better still, a French translation. He could have the Baron de Couture's version, which was perhaps a little old-fashioned, or Lagrange's, or those in the Nissard and Pancock series, or, again, there were two versions of striking elegance, one in verse and the other in prose, both from the pen of Monsieur de Pongerville of the French Academy. I don't need a translation, said Maurice proudly. Give me the prior de Vadome's copy. Monsieur Seriat went slowly up to the cupboard in which the jewel in question was contained. The keys were rattling in his trembling hand. He raised them to the lock and withdrew them again immediately and suggested that Maurice should have the common Lucretius published by Garnier. It's very handy, said he with an engaging smile. But the silence with which this proposal was received made it clear that resistance was useless. He slowly drew forth the volume from its place, and having taken the precaution to see that there wasn't a speck of dust on the tablecloth, he laid it tremblingly thereon before the great-grandson of Alexander de Esparview. Maurice began to turn the leaves, and when he got to page 137 he saw the stain which had been made with violet ink. It was about the size of a pea. Aye, that's it, said old Seriette, who had his eye on the Lucretius the whole time, that's the trace those invisible monsters left behind them. What, there were several of them, Monsieur Seriette, exclaimed Maurice. I cannot tell. But I don't know whether I have a right to have this blot removed since, like the blot Paul Louis Courier made on the Florentine manuscript, it constitutes a literary document, so to speak. Scarcely were the words out of the old fellow's mouth when the front door bell rang and there was a confused noise of voices and footsteps in the next room. Sariette ran forward at the sound and collided with Père Guinardon's mistress, old Zephyrine, who, with her tousled hair sticking up like a nest of vipers, her face aflame, her bosom heaving, her abdominal part like an eiderdown quilt puffed out by a terrific gale, was choking with grief and rage. And amid sobs and sighs and groans and all the innumerable sounds which, on earth, make up the mighty uproar to which the emotions of living beings and the tumult of nature give rise, she cried. He's gone, the monster. He's gone off with her. He's cleared out the whole shanty and left me to shift for myself with eighteen pence in my purse. And she proceeded to give a long and incoherent account of how Michel Guinardon had abandoned her and gone to live with Octavi, the breadwoman's daughter, and she let loose a torrent of abuse against the traitor. A man whom I've kept going with my own money for fifty years and more. For I've had plenty of the needful and known plenty of the upper ten and all. I dragged him out of the gutter and now this is what I get for it. He's a bright beauty, that friend of yours. The lazy scoundrel. Why, he had to be dressed like a child, the drunken contemptible brute. You don't know him yet, Monsieur Seriette. He's a forger. He turns out Giotto's, Giotto's, I tell you, and Fra Angelico's and Greco's, as hard as he can and sells them to art dealers, yes, and Fragonard's too, and Baudouin's. He's a debauchee, and doesn't believe in God. That's the worst of the lot, Monsieur Seriette, for without the fear of God. Long did Zephyrine continue to pour forth vituperations. When at last her breath failed her, Monsieur Seriette availed himself of the opportunity to exhort her to be calm and bring herself to look on the bright side of things. Guinardon would come back. A man doesn't forget anyone he's lived and got on well with for fifty years. These two observations only goaded her to a fresh outburst, and Zephyrine swore she would never forget the slight that had been put on her, she swore she would never have the monster back with her any more. And if he came to ask her to forgive him on his knees, she would let him grovel at her feet. Don't you understand, Monsieur Seriette? 
that I despise and hate him, that he makes me sick? Sixty times she voiced these lofty sentiments, sixty times she vowed she would never have Ginner done back with her again, that she couldn't bear the sight of him, even in a picture. Monsieur Sariette made no attempt to oppose a resolve which, after protestations such as these, he regarded as unshakable. He did not blame Zephyrine in the least. He even supported her. Unfolding to the deserted one a purer future, he told her of the frailty of human sentiment, exhorted her to display a spirit of renunciation and enjoined her to show a pious resignation to the will of God. Seeing, in truth, that your friend is so little worthy of affection. He was not suffered to continue. Zephyrine flew at him, and shaking him furiously by the collar of his frock coat, she yelled, half choking with rage, so little worthy of affection. Michel. Ah. My boy, you find another more kind, more gay, more witty, you find another like him, always young, yes, always. Not worthy of affection. Anyone can see you don't know anything about love, you old duffer. Taking advantage of the fact that Père Seriette was thus deeply engaged, young Diasparview slipped the little Lucretius into his pocket and strolled deliberately past the crouching librarian, bidding him adieu with a little wave of the hand. Armed with his talisman, he hastened to the place de Turnus to interview Madame Mira. She received him in a red drawing room where neither owl nor frog nor any of the paraphernalia of ancient magic were to be found. Madame Mira, in a prune-colored dress, her hair powdered, though already past her prime, was of very good appearance. She spoke with a certain elegance and prided herself on discovering hidden things by the help alone of science, philosophy, and religion. She felt the Morocco binding, feigning to close her eyes, and looking meanwhile through the narrow slit between her lids at the Latin title and the coat of arms which conveyed nothing to her. Accustomed to receive as tokens such things as rings, handkerchiefs, letters, and locks of hair, she could not conceive to what sort of individual this singular book could belong. By habitual and mechanical cunning she disguised her real surprise under a feigned surprise. Strange, she murmured, strange. I do not see quite clearly. I perceive a woman. As she let fall this magic word, she glanced furtively to see what sort of an effect it had and beheld on her questioner's face an unexpected look of disappointment. Perceiving that she was off the track, she immediately changed her oracle. But she fades away immediately. It is strange, strange. I have a confused impression of some vague form, a being that I cannot define, and having assured herself by a hurried glance that, this time, her words were going down, she expatiated on the vagueness of the person and on the mist that enveloped him. However, the vision grew clearer to Madame Mira, who was following a clue step by step. A wide street, a square with a statue, a deserted street, stairs. He is there in a bluish room, he is a young man, with pale and careworn face. There are things he seems to regret, and which he would not do again did they still remain undone. But the effort at divination had been too great. Fatigue prevented the clairvoyant from continuing her transcendental researches. She spent her remaining strength in impressively recommending him who consulted her to remain in intimate union with God if he wished to regain what he had lost and succeed in his attempts. On leaving Maurice placed a Lewis on the mantelpiece and went away moved and troubled, persuaded that Madame Mira possessed supernatural faculties, but unfortunately insufficient ones. At the bottom of the stairs he remembered he had left the little Lucretius on the table of the Pythoness, and, thinking that the old maniac Sariette would never get over its loss, went up to recover possession of it. On re-entering the paternal abode his gaze lighted upon a shadowy and grief-stricken figure. It was old Sariette, who in tones as plaintive as the wail of the November wind began to beg for his Lucretius. Maurice pulled it carelessly out of his greatcoat pocket. Don't flurry yourself, Monsieur Sariette, said he. There the thing is. 
Clasping the jewel to his bosom the old librarian bore it away and laid it gently down on the blue tablecloth, thinking all the while where he might safely hide his precious treasure, and turning over all sorts of schemes in his mind as became a zealous curator. But who among us shall boast of his wisdom? The foresight of man is short, and his prudence is forever being baffled. The blows of fate are ineluctable, no man shall evade his doom. There is no counsel, no caution that avails against destiny. Hapless as we are, the same blind force which regulates the courses of Adam and of star fashions universal order from our vicissitudes. Our ill fortune is necessary to the harmony of the universe. It was the day for the binder, a day which the revolving seasons brought round twice a year, beneath the sign of the ram and the sign of the scales. That day, ever since morning, Monsieur Seriat had been making things ready for the binder. He had laid out on the table as many of the newly purchased paper-bound volumes as were deemed worthy of a permanent binding or of being put in boards, and also those books whose binding was in need of repair, and of all these he had drawn up a detailed and accurate list. Punctually at five o'clock, old Amadi, the man from Ledger Massus, the binder in the Rue de la Baie, presented himself at the D'Esparview library and, after a double check had been carried out by Messier Seriet, thrust the books he was to take back to his master into a piece of cloth which he fastened into knots at the four corners and hoisted onto his shoulder. He then saluted the librarian with the following words, Good night, all, and went downstairs. Everything went off on this occasion as usual. But Amadi, seeing the Lucretius on the table, innocently put it into the bag with the others, and took it away without Monsieur Sariette's perceiving it. The librarian quitted the home of the philosophers in globes in entire forgetfulness of the book whose absence had been causing him such horrible anxiety all day long. Some people may take a stern view of the matter and call this a lapse, a defection of his better nature. But would it not be more accurate to say that fate had decided that things should come to pass in this manner, and that what is called chance, and is in fact but the regular order of nature, had accomplished this imperceptible deed which was to have such awful consequences in the sight of man? Monsieur Seriet went off to his dinner at the Cotter of X, and read his paper La Croix. He was tranquil and serene. It was only the next morning when he entered the abode of the philosophers and globes that he remembered the Lucretius. Failing to see it on the table he looked for it everywhere, but without success. It never entered his head that Amadie might have taken it away by mistake. What he did think was that the invisible visitant had returned, and he was mightily disturbed. The unhappy curator, hearing a noise on the landing, opened the door and found it was little Lyon, who, with a gold-braided kepi stuck on his head, was shouting vive la France and hurling dusters and feather brooms and Hippolyte's floor polish at imaginary foes. The child preferred this landing for playing soldiers to any other part of the house, and sometimes he would stray into the library. Monsieur Seriette was seized with the sudden suspicion that it was he who had taken the Lucretius to use as a missile and he ordered him, in threatening tones, to give it back. The child denied that he had taken it, and Monsieur Seriette had recourse to cajolery. Lion, if you bring me back the little red book, I will give you some chocolates. The child grew thoughtful, and in the evening, as Monsieur Seriette was going downstairs, he met Lyon, who said, There's the book. And, holding out a much-torn picture book called The Story of Gribouille, demanded his chocolates. A few days later the post brought Maurice the prospectus of an inquiry agency managed by an ex-employee at the prefecture of police. It promised celerity and discretion. He found that the address indicated a moustached gentleman morose and careworn, who demanded a deposit and promised to find the individual. The ex-police official soon wrote to inform him that very onerous investigations had been commenced and asked for fresh funds. Maurice gave him no more and resolved to carry on the search himself. Imagining, not without some likelihood, that the angel would associate with the wretched, seeing that he had no money, and with the exiled of all nations, like himself, revolutionaries, he visited the lodging houses at St. Ouen, at La Chapelle, Montmartre, and the Barrier d'Italie. He sought him in the Doss houses, public houses where they give you plates of tripe, and others where you can get a sausage for three sous, 
he searched for him in the cellars at the market and at Pere Momis. Maurice visited the restaurants where nihilists and anarchists take their meals. There he came across men dressed as women, gloomy and wild-looking youths, and blue-eyed octogenarians who laughed like little children. He observed, asked questions, was taken for a spy, had a knife thrust into him by a very beautiful woman, and the very next day continued his search in beer houses, lodging houses, houses of ill fame, gambling hells down by the fortifications, at the receivers of stolen goods, and among the Apaches. Seeing him thus pale, harassed, and silent, his mother grew worried. We must find him a wife, she said. It is a pity that Mademoiselle de la Verdelier has not a bigger fortune. Abbe Patouille did not hide his anxiety. This child, he said, is passing through a moral crisis. I am more inclined to think, replied Monsieur René d'Esparview, that he is under the influence of some bad woman. We must find him an occupation which will absorb him and flatter his vanity. I might get him appointed secretary to the Committee for the Preservation of Country Churches, or consulting counsel to the Syndicate of Catholic Plumbers. 